Hello, and welcome to the Tavern Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Tenkar, and this is another of our series of designers and makers, Fireside Chats. Fireside Chats, because we don't do interviews, we sit down with friends. Uh, with me today is Kevin, also known as your Pro GM. I believe that's also your Twitch channel. That is one of my Twitch channels, yeah. And uh, I'm hoping to do more with it than... I have up right now. What I do is kind of um, private, you know, like uh, private sessions and stuff. So ah, I don't have a lot okay. of media out there. All right. Well, Kevin's our guest today. Now we're going to jump into our five questions. And then, uh, as is usual, we will uh, start the hex crawl. Uh, Kevin, uh, tell us about your first RPG experience. So it's kind of interesting um i feel like i'm usually one of the youngest people in a in a group of players at least with the places that i've networked and that kind of thing um most people you know they played the original game or you know some of the uh stuff like pre uh 90s and that kind of thing well um my first rpg experience where i was kind of like creating the story uh outside of you know just playing around in the yard with people. Um, I actually was playing in an IRC chat channel. Um, I had found, um, like, the internet was crazy. When I got our first gateway computer, and I was on, like, Yahoo, when it still was basically like a message board. Um, Yeah, I loved video games. So I would just look up stuff about different video games I liked. And one of them was Mega Man. And so I stumbled upon this website that was doing both play-by-post and live IRC role-playing for Mega Man. They had kind of put together a uh, a pretty simple mechanic system, and uh, you know we were actually like rolling dice at our at our uh, desk and that kind of thing. And um, yeah, I just went into an IRC chat channel and uh, met some people, and you kind of put put a real simple kind of character together. And um, I did that a few times, um, and it really just sparked everything else, just research into what an RPG was, because I didn't really... The only context that I had at that point was that I had played RPGs on um, Super Nintendo. Like, I'd played Chrono okay. Trigger and and Super Mario RPG, so I was like, that's what an RPG is to me. But then... Right. I went did did more research and I'm like into the history and that kind of thing. I was like, wow, this is like this is the thing. You know, it's like making your own stories and you know creating your own thing and you know creating people and places and the ideas around them. That was that was the way to go. Well, that's that's an, <clears throat> you really came in with a non-standard RPG. That's interesting. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, 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 it, listen, the you know the bread and butter is somebody came in with some some version of D and D. There's been a few exceptions, but to come in with basically a, a home brewed system that you found via the early internet is pretty damn cool. Yeah, and then after that, I had a there was like a local hobby shop, and they were more they were more kind of like the collectible cards and the, the war games and that kind of stuff as most hobby shops have to be to be to, you know stay in business. But right. uh, they had RPGs and stuff too, and so the, and kind of in the back of the shop they would play. And I was I was still really young. I was like you know, eleven, twelve years old, right? But but I did go to the go to the back part of the shop a couple of times and uh, um, played with them. Played some BattleTech the first time, and then the second time uh, they were actually that was my first exposure to D and D, and that was AD and D, uh, and. Mm-hmm. I rolled up a character. Is it kind of kind of a the typical story, you know? You roll up a character session session zero for you. You you play a little bit, and then um, I had actually skipped out on a taekwondo class to go over to the hobby shop, so uh, <laughs> I didn't get to go back to the shop for a while. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that's classic. Well, then uh, obviously your your introduction to uh, gaming was. Uh, Pretty cool and pretty unique, but these days, what's your go-to RPG system? So the one that I've worked with the most is uh, D&D 5th Edition. 
um, because of my pro GMing and uh, what they had done when it comes to supporting the product made it easy right. to kind of go in there and uh, do some performance, tell people about what I was doing, and then you know found some clients from there. Fair enough. That makes sense too. And Five E is uh, certainly the RPG system that uh, was it rising tide lifts all ships. It's oh, certainly yeah. been it's certainly been the one that's brought this hobby back to life. Yeah, I've I've really been. I, I was happy with uh, when they did the D and D next um, play test. Uh, they did a lot of iteration in there, uh, some good ideas. And, uh, I, I mean, some of the ideas that didn't make it to the final uh, version uh, of what's in the book are, are still in, like, Unearthed Arcana and on the website and that kind of stuff. So a lot of a lot of good rules variants. Yeah, I was part of the uh, D&D Next uh, friend, was it friends and family uh, part of the, the beta testing. And, so you were uh, right in there super early. Oh, we were in there too early. Uh, I'll be honest with you, <laughs> because we, well, you know, we initially enjoyed it, and, we, and here's the problem too with us. I think is that we were like, hey, we're going to use these rules to actually start like a campaign, but every two or three weeks the rules would change, and they wouldn't yeah. just change from like I don't know from A to A one. It would change right. from like a to y right and it would yeah. be a total f- flip of and after doing that for i'm gonna say two and a half three months uh the group burned burned out our, our dm especially burned out i think right. I, that was part of the issue right and, you got all uh, those uh yeah those mechanics things i mean you can't you can't really uh stay consistent even with the world um it's gonna yeah feel different yeah, it was it was really frustrating. So then we went from that to me jamming, and uh, I think uh, when I came back to jamming for the first time, oh god, it was like 15 years at that time, uh, ran Osric and Venture Conqueror King. Those are the two games that I wound up running initially, and yeah, I was I wasn't gonna try doing next at that point. That was the group that was frustrated like that. It's like that. Oh, that isn't gonna work. Yeah, I I saw it. Um, what was it? Uh, like I got right in when they sent out the beta material um, to the wider audience, and right. um, it was. I think it was like, yeah, it, it doesn't sound like what you're talking about. It sounds like they had really kind of stumbled on the uh, the advantage disadvantage thing, and um, yeah, we, that, you know, that, that I'm not even that sure out. if we. I'm not even sure if we actually had that mechanic in it and during our time of, of playing with it. Right. So I did uh, I did some play testing with the Keep on the Borderlands module that they put out, like we did, um, you know, just text and everything. And um, I was uh, doing some testing with that with some friends. And, uh, man, I was just, I was so hyped for, for that product to come out. And, it, and it's, I, I think that's something that, that many people don't realize either is that, when a beta goes public, when when the public mm-hmm. beta goes out, like when Pathfinder puts out its or published its public beta for Pathfinder two, right? You're it, it, it's it, at at that point the vast majority of the rules are locked down. They're trying to find major issues that maybe weren't found mm-hmm. with with uh, localized play, but yeah. for the most part, an open beta is like a, it's like a stress test. But it's also, uh, I, I, I did narcotics as a cop in the late 90s. And it's also like giving out that free piece of crack. To, <laughs> to, you know, you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're giving people a free taste. And with that free taste, you're hoping that you're going to get lifelong customers. Sure. And I, I would say, if I was going to say anything to uh, Wizards of the Coast and how they're, they've handled the ND, I would just say that... Um, I mean, I know that they're a book and and playset company, and that's like something that drives it, and that's why they've kind of branched out into the more the the tabletop games like Lords Lords of Waterdeep and that kind of thing. Um, I think that's a great move for them because um, they're gonna every there are gonna be people out there that 
copy things and and you know hack things and that kind of thing and what they have to understand is that um they have to as a company do something that adds value beyond what people can copy for free and i know that a lot of stuff you can copy for free now i mean we got tabletop simulator we've got um what do you call it uh you know you just the pdfs just the printed material you know something that you know a magazine used to be a way to make money and now a magazine is marketing and that's like yeah. pure marketing and that's just what it is yeah you know times change and that's that's something that, that certainly has changed yeah all right well now you came in at least to the dungeons and dragons world of things with ad and d did you ever experience a basic expert um, I did not um, until very recently. Well, actually, no. <laughs> How recently is very recently? Um, I played with Jonathan Henry. He's uh, he ran uh, the or was one of the moderators of the G Plus tabletop role playing community, and uh, he would run Gamer Chat, uh, which was a uh, Google Hangouts. It was by invitation, but it wasn't hard to get an invitation. It was basically just you had to like see the thing, and if you saw the post, you you could join it. Um, and so it was, it was awesome. Like, uh, you'd have some people that were designers come in, you'd have some people that played a lot, games journal, like, uh, RPG journalism, that kind of stuff. Um, can't really think of names off the top of my head, but it was, it was supposed to be kind of like a, like a sit down at a coffee shop kind of conversation. Nothing was recorded. It was really just kind of a place to, um, really network and talk semi-privately about what was going on in the industry and the game that you were playing and that kind of thing. So um, the the topics could get kind of heated and controversial and, you know, you kind of get over into politics and religion and that kind of stuff. It's, it's kind of hard to stay away from those things with RPGs because RPGs are full of politics and religion. It's part of, of what makes them interesting. So, but yeah. That's, well, that was uh, my, that's where I experienced it. All right, well, the reason why I was asking about basic expert is a basic expert has uh, a concept that, for the most part, uh, later iterations of Dungeons and Dragons have gone away from, which is mm-hmm. race as class. Right. Which, uh, you know, if you're playing a dwarf, you're playing a dwarf. You have to be right. probably a dwarf and fighter, but, you know. Uh, right. Where, what's your feelings of that? I mean, you you mostly a five e uh, mm-hmm. GM these days, but what's your what's your idea on on racist class? Well, narratively, I think it's like that's that's the important thing. Like if you're playing from a place where um, you have a race and they are very homogenous, or there's something about them that is very different, like with elf as a race it was the magic using you know was a was a big part of what an elf was so i think it's a way that you could set a um uh, a player apart a lot um in a way that is core to what that person's makeup is and i don't want to get into like genetics or (laughs) something like that no no but but it's like but really that that is what it is you know like when you're saying racist class you're saying that this thing genetically can do this thing that other people don't or does this thing in a certain way or has you know is mostly this way um i think it's fine um a lot of what i've seen you know in our space there are a lot of um individuals out there that don't want to be uh restrained by anything right right Um, but what i would say is that working from constraint is actually where you get um you get um uh, execution like you get something actually done if you have a palette of 10 million colors where do you start you know um my my idea is that when somebody comes into a game or something you make the palette you make the choices simple so that they can wrap their heads around it and then from there you can go. Now I know a lot of the stuff that is in kind of the hobby space and people make themselves um, is for intermediate to advanced players. I would say that 
um, there are systems that are intermediate to advanced systems. And you, we know this. We have the basic advanced uh, you know, progression. There are play sets for oh, yeah. 3.5, 5th edition, that kind of thing, that are very simple so that people can learn how to play. Right. And uh, those are usually the most successful products. And it's because most people don't get past that. You know, that's that's enough product for most people. So um, I, I guess uh, where I'm going from all that is just like uh, races class. Uh, it's a great way to simplify things, even down to not having to pick a class. You know, you have all these abilities and that kind of thing. And this is who you are. And you're going to play that, embody that. Yeah, I mean, limitations aren't uh, there. Limitations like that are as limiting as you allow them to be as mm-hmm. a as a player. You know, not every dwarf is in, in basic is going to be the same dwarf. You're going to role play it differently, equip them differently, right. have different expectations. And like you said, if you have a million color choices on on your palette, how do you choose? But if you have a limited number of color choices, you know what? You, c- colors mix. You can always, right. you know, e- e- even if you are playing a dwarven fighter or a dwarf that happens to, the, the default seems to be fighter, mm-hmm. you can, you can, Add some aspects to your character through equipment, ten foot poles, and and other stuff that makes him more of a spelunker, uh, mm-hmm. a little bit of a, a less less necessarily purely of purely that dwarf, but checking right. for traps, using the mirror to pick around corners, like you know, play them differently, make those changes in your character that makes your your character different than others of the quote same race right. or. Same class. So yeah, I, I I agree. Yeah, what I think some of the uh, some of it is is this resistance to play an archetype, and um, I don't really understand that because it's like a, it seems like a lot of that comes from people that have never just sat down and play, been like, you know what, I'm gonna make a human fighter, and I'm gonna be mechanically basically as basic as it gets but i have a persona i have a character there there's a lot of there's a lot that you can do with the intangibles of of an rpg that will make that character memorable or interesting you know and 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 people forget that i and i've had that discussion it's this discussion of classes goes back to I'm sure people who went from uh, basic D and D, original D and D, who went to A D and D, and then from A D and D on Earth Arcana, adding in extra classes. Mm-hmm. Uh, options are great, but in, in my experience with old school gamers, they always seem to generally uh, gravitate back to the original classes, the core right. classes, because those have the most flexibility. Yeah, they're they're very pure archetypes, and it's like. You know, you've got the cleric, the fighter, the magic user, and the and the thief, and those are those are the most archetypical. Um, I would say across the board. I mean, I think they're they might be Western archetypes. You know, maybe if you're playing right. with somebody from a very different culture in a diff- different part of the world, maybe they have their archetypes. And honestly, I'd be interested to you know play a game where the archetypes are different, but because the historical ish context was different. Um, that would be really cool, but it's but it's hard because there's a lot of barriers. There's a lot of barriers of maybe language or uh, just culture. You know, it's yeah. it's hard to play. It's hard to play outside of your culture and um, really um, portray it in a way that's authentic because you don't know. <laughs> you know, so it's it's true. And and Western <clears throat> fantasy role playing. Is is based on uh, to a large extent the fiction, the fables, and the lore mm-hmm. of w- Western Middle Ages, which is why you don't see too many games set in in, in Rome. It's turn, you know, in, in the Roman Empire, because a, a, our culture has this background that we this communal history, f- false history, but this the lore that we that we that we look back on. Right. And we can relate to that, and that's I think it's even why I think you know when it comes to movies, science fiction is much more popular than fantasy. Right. But when it when it comes to fiction, 
the written word, it, it flips. It's like right. fantasy is, the, is your, your bigger. And when it comes to role-playing games, uh, <clears throat> I mean, Starfinder, I'm sure, made, you know, high on money, but I don't think it was a success they were hoping it would be, or else we wouldn't be seeing Pathfinder 2 so quickly right. behind it. Right. Uh, well, it's the. I don't know. I've I've got a theory behind this. Um, we can probably talk about that in the hex crawl. So. Um, okay. Well, yeah. we'll hold on to it for a moment, then we'll go on to our next question. How do you feel about save or die as a concept? Not the uh, not the podcast. <laughs> I think that uh, save or die is is always excellent. Um, <laughs> I think that there are things out there in the world that are just that stark of well you're alive or well you're dead and when you're playing an rpg it's not you know you're not you're not writing a novel you are you're in a world that can do things to you and if you make bad decisions or just decisions and um you know some uh, what i want to call it like some lich uh had a had a real interest in a in a certain trap that uh that liquefied flesh well um Maybe you're just dead, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then everybody else gets to learn from your experience, and 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 that's what being an adventurer is all about. I mean, you don't. Um, I I feel like even in in these um, RPG contexts, it's like you don't uh, you don't go out adventuring to be safe. You could do a lot of no. other things that are safe, right? Like you could you could help plow the fields and make a little bit of money, and you know, like have. You can make a, you can make a whole RPG around you know a simple agrarian lifestyle, but it's not gonna really be that interesting. Nah, that's that's why we have the lore. But right. not only well, not only that, I mean, you know, save or die. It, with with great risk comes great reward. Right. And especially, oh, I guess not just with five E, but with even with AD and D, higher level characters are hard to balance adventures against because they are so powerful. And yeah. something like Save or Die kind of keeps that, them in check a little bit, makes mm -hmm. makes them think before they act. Especially if you telegraph. I mean, I, I always feel that Save or Die should be like, all right, you found the great MacGuffin, you, you're, you found the big bad guy, and somehow it just looks too easy to approach him. Well, expect mm -hmm. the trap. Right. It might be save or die. Yeah, you know, I, I I never liked it when it's just you turn the corner and you step into a pit trap and it's endless. Right. You know. Yeah. Well, uh, I think a lot of this has to do with um, really, what I want to say, like creating a a fun um experience. Like, y if you are if you are somebody that really embraces just simulation, you know, here's the world. Here's what's happening, and you don't manipulate things to where it makes people excited, makes people interested. It um, creates mystery, um, stuff that wasn't there. You know, it's like right. <laughs> you're uh, to me. Um, you know, we got things that can that can do simulation. They're called computers. Let's let them do that. And us as storytellers, um, we need to breathe some narrative into this space. And I think that the people that are skilled at doing that, um, taking what's there, changing it a bit, maybe just narratively or, um, you know, NPC-wise, what's going on with people or their mannerisms or those kind of things, those are the people that create entertaining content beyond what's in the module. Yeah, it, it, it does take skill. and. Uh, the skill I had when I first came into gaming uh, in the early 80s uh, is certainly not uh, the the person I am now when it comes to GMing. I like to think I've, I've learned a lot, and I've learned the pacing and the storytelling mm -hmm. and, and the rules enough that I, I can make it an enjoyable experience. And... and by the way, I, I think you need two different skill sets, if, or, or or multiple different skill sets, if you're running for a campaign with your friends, if you're running 
in a public environment, if you're running at a convention, which is going to be a one shot, it's all, they're all different skills that are involved because there's different pacing that you need to have. And I think, uh, a, a good GM learns how to do best with the group that they have. You have right. to adjust for your group. So, but this is probably all talk for, for the next, for, for the second half of this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll, go, we'll we'll hit our last question and then we'll sandbox. Um, you came into gaming around 11, 11 years old. Yeah, I would say around 10, 11. 10 or 11. So you, you were preaching. What, what would mm-hmm. you at, at 10 or 11 think of what you're doing now, where you are in the hobby, what you've accomplished? Well, about that time, actually a little bit earlier, um, I had a friend that uh, I spent a lot of time with and would talk with at recess and that kind of thing. Um, this, what I did <laughs> when I was in recess, when I was like kind of that preteen thing, was uh, there was the playground and then there was this little alley that was next to where um, where the playground was. And um, I mean, it was a it wasn't what am I trying to say? It, it was paved, but it was like roughly paved, right? But what right. I would do is me and my friend would walk up and down this alley. And it wasn't like, you know, between buildings or whatever. It was just like, you know, an access right there. And we would just walk up and down there and we would talk about things. Like we would talk about the games that we'd been playing. We'd, been, we'd talk about creating stories and that kind of thing. And so it was kind of like an epiphany when I found out that there were other people that did this kind of thing you know it's like um so i guess where i'm going from there is like i've wanted to well at that point i was like i want to i want to make a video game company you know what i mean like right I, that was that was what i was thinking i wanted to do so it got me interested not only in creative space but also the business space and um so if i looked at what i was doing now versus then um I think I would be just like really proud of myself and just be like, well, we got we still got a long way to go, but uh, but I've I've proven that 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 a certain way of uh, monetizing this kind of game is possible. Cool. All right. Well, you know, you're not, you you pretty much lead us right now into our sandbox. All because, right. All right. Now we're in the sandbox aspect. You know. If I was a real professional podcast, this is where I, I would stop the first half of the podcast and then like insert an ad in the middle. But I don't do that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I Yeah. Well, it's, listen. For me, it's it, it's just pure laziness. Oh, I, yeah, okay. I like I like to keep things simple as possible. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, listen, it, it's not an easy endeavor to make up. Make money in this hobby of ours. A lot of people try. There's a lot of self publishers. There's a lot of uh, people that freelance and uh, people do make some, but it's 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 not an easy road. And um, you've taken a different angle to it. Let's yeah, talk about that. Sure. I I kind of looked out into the landscape, and um, I mean I'm creative but I'm not the most creative person in the world. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of products out there, a lot of game systems out there that are above and beyond what I could do with maybe like a decade of work by myself. So um, why don't I leverage that is, is the way that I look at it. It's like, I've gone out, talked to the small publishers, um, just kind of thrown around some ideas on what I could do um, to help them um, promote their products. Um, the, the issue is, um, like, it, it's, it's all about competing for attention. And I've been listening to a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk very, very recently, and uh, he's a great marketer. He's, he does a lot of, uh, now he does a lot of the kind of like entrepreneurial speaking and that kind of stuff, because that's what you do when you get, when you're somebody that's, you know, quote unquote, on top of the game. But, um, that's, that's kind of what it is. It's like you have to compete for attention, and a lot of these systems, a lot of this material, um, it just doesn't garner the attention. M- maybe not on the merits of the actual material, 
but just on the marketing machine that's behind them. Like when you're competing with Hasbro and you're just a a you know a small publisher, you can't expect to have an audience on the same scale. But you have to understand that your economics are totally different. Like if you make you personally could make I mean, you know, it depends on your situation, but if you live in rural America or something like that, you could make twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a year and live pretty comfortably. Right. Um, so you just have to kind of look at all of these angles of what you're doing and say, well, this product is, you know, might only do this, but if I do this, basically I'm doing what these guys are doing because they're employing, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people in different capacities to help and push these products forward. So um, small business is just totally different than corporate business. And I think a lot of small business people want to try and copy what big businesses are doing. And you can't do it. They're going to win no. at scale. Yeah, because uh, you, you, you're trying to emulate a, a, a business model, like you said, that's, that's not going to work for a one-man company when you're up against Paizo, which is of the coast. Right. And, and they're, not, it's not only the people working on it, but it's things like advertising resources and mm-hmm. the fact that any announcement they make is picked up everywhere. Within our hobby. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, and I mean, there are people that make their living, or at least, you know, like their little bit of a podcast, maybe spending money or, you know, how, whatever it is in their lifestyle, um, reporting on that, you know, so, and I'm, you know, I, I think that's great, you know, however people are able to leverage the raw material that's out there. Um, and that's where I think, There are a lot more people that are kind of where I am, which is there's a lot of raw material out there. And when I say raw, it's there's a lot of work that's already been put into it. But to me, that's raw material. Like I I would say creatively making my own modules and dungeons for D&D, that was like my first creative outlet. But as I got older, that actually kind of shifted towards audio. So I started DJing. I started mixing music. And um, things out there. I started getting into the um, the the legal stuff around all that, and basically okay. it's like you have to make a choice. Um, you know, if you're using is under a regular license, um, you know, you can never sell it. But the way that they have it now, I mean, you can kind of leverage it to get some attention. I mean. It's just, (laughs) it's hacking the system, right? Every time, you know, like there are all these walls put up by copyright and creative people and people like me that want to use this raw material to create something new and maybe leverage some of the attention that that stuff got. But really just looking at this and be like, this is a good, like, you know, (laughs) you're out in the field and you're picking, you're picking carrots and you're like, this is a really nice carrot, right? So you're just, for me, it's, it's not about how, um, popular something is. It's about, I've used it. Can, can I use it to create something new, you know, alongside of whatever I'm injecting into it? And it's like, um, that is, you know, there are all these barriers, but you have to find your way around the barriers. But the great thing is, is with social media, the amount of barriers that we've ever had. So, oh, yeah, um, social media lowers social those media. barriers. Yeah, good. No, it's like you're, you're right, social media has so much lowered barriers of entry to any kind of marketing. You're just you're, you're limited to really your your, your yeah, own right. ability to grow your audience. That's your limitation. Okay, you just rubber banded back, you were breaking up there. I didn't, oh. I didn't hear you last. No, I, I was saying that you're basically limited by your own ability to grow your audience. Let's doing it again. Uh, gosh darn it. All right, hold on a second. I'm going to drop out real quick and drop back in. Yes, this will still be in the podcast, folks. My Discord will see if... Uh, there we go. How's this sound now? Uh, that sounded better. 
Yeah, sometimes. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah sometimes. Discord has growing pains. <laughs> That's okay. But yeah, you might want to cut that out. But then, yeah, just uh, your last comment. I think. Yeah, no, what I was saying is that you, when, when it comes to social media, you, your, your limitations are, are pretty much your ability to grow your audience. And if you can grow your audience, and if you can figure out how to do that, it, it's free marketing. Right. And organic reach is part of it. But also, I mean, if you're in a situation where, you know, you're trying to figure out how to invest or you've got other people that are trying to figure out how to invest some money that they have. Um, I mean, just throw a proposition out for people. You don't have to make any promises. You just have to make a deal. And what I'm talking about is just, uh, you know, like leveraging some ad space as well, along with the, the rest of it. And if you do both um, and you have something that you believe in that creates value, like you're creating value, right? Whatever you're doing, whether you're writing or you're doing the service that I do or um, any of those things, um, you put some money in, you know, you put a hundred bucks a month or something like that into ads and you're going to get more attention. It's just uh, now (laughs) you do have to make something compelling to click on or swipe on or, you know, it just depends on what platform you're on. So there are a lot of different competencies that you have to have or what's a good alternative is just going out on social media, um, networking very widely, be and be willing to barter with people. Like if you're able to do a certain thing and they want it and they can do a certain thing that you want, um, there are billions of people to talk to you out on the internet. Um, you can find people that want exactly what you want and you want exactly what they, they do. You just have to go out there and put in the work of looking around. Yeah, that's a good point. And I've seen a lot of that barter going on and, uh, or even just volunteering. People just, Mm -hmm. they want to help. Uh, There's a large amount of this community that wants to help their, their fellow creators. And, uh, then their, their payment is often your goodwill. And, uh, it's amazing. It's it's really the 80, 20. I mean, it's like, you have to focus on what you're doing. You have to. You can't make your job helping, you know, other people unless you're doing it as, hey, I'm, you know, I'm retired. Um, this is something I just like to do in my spare time. You know, those kind of things you can do, you know, you can volunteer and that's cool. That's awesome. But you, what I mean as in the you is you as a creator, um, you can't get derailed from what you're doing. You have to understand that you got to put your works first and then yeah have a have a taste and have a step into what other people are doing and then from there you know you find good people to work with collaborations you work up you know like you said tide raises all boats it really does it's, it's a beautiful thing about uh, what's going on in this hobby and, and hopefully it, it continues maybe uh, pathfinder 2 will give another boost to the hobby or well, or maybe not i don't know well it's i mean Anytime, anytime you keep developing something, like if the, if if the engineering of the mechanics is actually improving people's experience, that's where these new products will flourish. If they're being over-engineered and they're just being changed to be changed, then um, that's where you'll see the decline. And um, I mean, different niches need different things. You know, the Pathfinder niche has a lot of stuff to look at and they've embraced that Uh, now does pathfinder 2 embrace that who knows i mean they may have come out with a game that's totally different and when you go into a space mechanically that's totally different um or different enough to where people aren't comfortable with it you're gonna have to close and what i mean by that is like you're going to have to get these people to convert. And how do you do that? Well, it has to be something they want. Like, this is the thing. People think that marketing and sales is going to sell something that's not good in the first place. That's not what marketing and sales is. Marketing and sales is to get more attention on something that's already good. Right. And so um, (laughs) everybody out there that wants to just, you know, blindly grow their followers or something like that and not produce anything, um, that's a mistake. 
you have to spend 20% of your time-ish on promoting and then 80% on what you're doing. So it's kind of like, it's almost like an, an, a nested 80-20, right? It's like you have the 80-20, this 80% is on what I'm doing, this 20% is on what other people are doing, and then in that 80%, 20% of that it should be promotion, 80% of that should be content creation. Mm-hmm. That, that actually makes sense. And now I, I got a question for you then. Mm-hmm. We, we, were, we, were, we were talking about the big boys. We're talking about Witches of the Coast. We're talking about Paizo mm-hmm. and how it's impossible to really compete on their levels. But if you find your own niche, qu- yeah, your own niche, your own corner of the universe, mm-hmm. are, are you, and, and you can be number one or number two in, in your niche. Um, personally, in my opinion, I, I think that puts you in a much stronger position than somebody who is uh, competing against the, the the big boys in the industry yeah. and, and not coming anywhere close to them. Yeah, it's it's kind of like if you're trying to clone um, something. Um, <laughs> this is why I tell people really is like if you're trying to clone something, you better have more money than the guy that you're cloning. Um, or in, in money, resources, connections. I mean, you know, you better have more capital altogether than the person you're cloning, or else it's not going to work. It's just not. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, just think of it this way. Like, somebody can have an idea, a concept, like, to just kind of use the video game thing, because almost everybody plays some of these games. I play them too. The new, newer FPS games like Fortnite, and player unknown battlegrounds all those came from a game the first game that did something like this and because there was a technology limitation before um this happened there was a game called h1z1 and this was like a zombie shooter game but they ended up putting a mode in it where you could get like i can't remember what their cap was but a lot of people in in a free-for-all match where the arena kept getting smaller and smaller it was the first real game to do that kind of thing um, successfully. So what happened was that game was not really successful, but the idea of Battle Royale, which is what that's called, um, just it's it's like it's you don't get to see the birth of a new gaming genre very often. And this is really the birth of a new gaming genre. So, and I'll be honest with you, you probably don't even recognize it as the birth when it's happening. It's in right, you don't, you, you don't, but, but who recognized it were, were different teams, like the Epic Games team that made Fortnite, the Player Unknowns team that played, made Player Unknowns Battlegrounds, the, um, what is it, uh, those were the earlier, earlier ones, and then now you have Apex Legends, which is kind of like the new EA thing, but EA was not going to do it until somebody else had already established the market, because they're the biggest so they can they can make a clone of Fortnite and PUBG and H1Z1 after the market is established. They 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 are they are able because of their size to wait until it's the right moment to that for them to start developing something. And and really, it's like they probably didn't wait. They probably saw H1Z1. They probably had people that played it, and they were probably like. This is new. This is a new genre. This is a, a, I mean, it's not a completely new gaming experience because it's still FPS, but it's new right. enough to where people are out of their minds for it, right? So it's the time for them to start developing. And then they get on their two, three, four year development cycle and they're going to repurpose things from different games, you know, just development wise. Right. And they can they can launch, <laughs> and they can be the biggest. Um, they don't have to be first. They can be the second mouse that gets the cheese. So I guess uh, what I'm saying, how that relates to RPGs, it's it's just kind of a different thing. It's like if you're trying to clone D and D, if you want to be the thing that everybody plays, um, you have to um, what do you call it? Uh, you have to have more leverage. Um, but if you're doing something like Swords and Wizardry, which is basically like, I would call that more like a reboot of something. You know, oh, yeah. it's, it's more of a, it's more of a re, repurposing of something to be able to do something 
legally, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and so um, I think that's fine. And uh, but you you know your niche, right? And you know right. the cons, and you know your environment, and that's the environment. Now, is that ever going to be you know? Are you ever going to be a multi-billionaire be, from you know doing OSR? Probably not. But if no. you enjoy it and you know you can support your lifestyle and everything uh, around whatever whatever else, the the hobbyist community to me is just it's fantastic. Like I just feel like with a lot of these things, and I'm kind of talking now more from like the streaming side of things the the performance side of things right. people people watch ninja and they watch shroud and they watch these people that have hundreds of thousands of viewers but if you go out into the space where people are like you know they have five viewers they have 12 viewers they have 15 viewers they they may have a great show um but you have to go out and explore to find that great stuff it's kind of like um you know, it's just like anybody that would go to music festivals or, you know, like journalism, basically. You know, there's there's a lot of space to do journalism on these things. You know, it's it's almost like the before they were famous kind of thing. Because if you do journalism on like 800 people and you make enough of a connection where they know who you are and you did something for them, like you said, the volunteering, like mm-hmm. what I've been doing is uh, I go into Twitch channels and I clip people when they have a great moment because maybe they're not going to do it. You know, maybe they miss something. Maybe they, they don't do it fast enough because they're still streaming. You're clipping it right now. It's relevant in the moment, you know. So uh, that's, how I've, that's how I've leveraged um, trying to build my brand is, you know, I have the things I do, the mixing and the audio production. And I'm going to be putting out some content around those things. But, and, and then I have the pro GMing stuff that I have done. And, and uh, it's a gig job. You know, sometimes you, you have gigs flown out your ears, and sometimes you don't work for four months. So right. um, just being a ser- kind of a serial entrepreneur, having those small things, figuring out how you can help people to where they want to help you. Um, that's, it, I don't know. Some people might be against that. It might just be like, well, somebody should just love you for who you are and blah, blah, blah. It's like, look, that's not how it works in business. <laughs> it's value for value in business. And the more value that you give, the more value that's, you should get in return. It doesn't work like that all the time. But basically, if you didn't get val- the value of somebody wants to help you or somebody comes and subscribes to your channel or something like that, they... um they may, uh, or I'm sorry, you built your personal skill. Like I'm building my skill on being able to clip things faster. I'm building my skill with multiple social media platforms. Even if these things don't bring me uh, value out in the marketplace, they bring me marketable, marketable value for myself. I can tell somebody, oh yeah, I've done that. Oh yeah, I did that. Oh yeah, I've worked with that platform. Sorry, I, I I'm kind of a rambler, so. so no, dude, it's it's that's that's fine, man. It's like I like I said before the show, this goes where it goes, man. That, that's that's yeah. fine. But uh, it, it, I guess like any other aspect of this industry, if you want to be successful, it also requires a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, you know, without it, if you if if you are putting in you know, less than full effort to be successful. You're not going to be successful. What I like to say is that you can put in part time, but you got to put in full effort, right? Like if you got other things in your life that take priority, it's fine. But try and also make yourself a priority, set some time aside, you know, to do these kind of things. You know, we got, I guess we got like three things that we usually juggle. You know, we've got personal commitments, uh, what we have to do for, um, employment and then all the other things that we want to work on. Um, I mean, if you're working on building something, you're really just sacrificing leisure time. You know, it's like, and some people <laughs> will look at my stream if I'm doing a streamy thing or something like that and be like, well, he's playing a game. It's like, but you're playing it with purpose, right? You're playing it to entertain. Right. 
you're playing it to market, you're playing it to promote. Um, there's the intent is the thing that is really important. I mean, you were a police officer, so you understand, yep. you know, intent. <laughs> you know, definitely. An, an accident is different than you know, like premeditated something. So right. it's the same thing. It's like, um, you know, if you you can do anything with a purpose where you're learning, getting better, developing. And nowadays, people are just interested in the story. And if you present it, it, it like, you know, the storytelling aspect of being a dungeon master has really been something that's shaped, you know, what I've wanted to do to create value in the world. So um, the storytelling just goes into social media. It just goes into everything that I'm trying to do for myself and for the people around me. And that's how you build community. It's how you build um whatever you're doing. Um the only, <laughs> I mean there is that that's that's part of everything. Like if if I had a different job, like if I was stacking boxes somewhere mm -hmm. and I could figure out a way to leverage showing how people how to stack boxes efficiently in an entertaining way, um then you're creating content. And it's around something that is relevant to whatever business you're in. Me personally, it's like my family's been all like military people and worked for the government and that kind of thing. So all this business stuff has been on my own. <laughs> like I didn't have a family to show me how to do this stuff. You know, I've just been really passionate about wanting to do it for so long. Well, yeah, that's interesting. And the idea that, I mean, for me, I was slow to fully come into certain social media. I was slow to join mm -hmm. Facebook. I was resistant because my, my generation didn't grow up on this. I mean, I graduated high school in 85. Right. I, 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 was, I, I was thrilled to have a beeper when, right. when you know, you, you found those beeper hacks. Like, all right, well, uh, you know, you can, ha what words can you send via the beeper? Or, right. I, uh, <laughs> it's funny it's like um along with that though but i think of like you know where you're talking about the time table that you're talking about and it's like uh, i feel like i miss the boat on a lot of things like i miss the boat on programming right like my i it wasn't even in my mind okay my my aunt when i was let's see how old was i when i was like six seven years old right she had a commodore 64 that she did word processing on right and Damn. um they had a uh what do you call it um you know that she had jump man you know she had um they had an uh, you know there was an atari 2600 in my house um okay. but it was like i was too i was too young and the culture as it was changing was not pushing me towards well you need to learn a skill it was pushing me towards you need to good, get good grades in school so it's like me thinking about programming at that point it wasn't even on my radar because everybody was just like well just just go study math and, and science and and then you'll go to college and then you'll 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 have a great job and it's like and i kind of bought into that and so i didn't think about these other things you know as skills i thought of them right. as oh well that's a computer sitting over there you know so, so, it, it, it's hobbyist that's yeah. you know I mean, listen, I I got my BA in history because you were told you're going to college and you're going to get a BA or and, and whatever. And right. The fault was history because I was a gamer. And again, you know, fantasy gaming is built upon, you know, Middle Ages and Renaissance, you know, lore. Right. So I've tried to go in for the history of it. Right. But yeah, my my uh, I actually did a Revolutionary War reenacting when I was growing up. Um, my oh, parents nice. like that, so I did get a taste of that uh, that um, disconnection from technology, you know. And I yeah, kind of it, I, oh, good. Go no, yeah. I was just gonna say I kind of um, it's compartmentalizing. It's like I do a lot with social media and online and that kind of thing, but when I sit down at a table with people, there's no phone to be found. You know, it's I like. Gotcha. If I have to bring it because, you know, somebody might have an emergency or something like that, um, it's in my phone on vibrate or like in my pocket on vibrate. 
Right. Um, if I go out with somebody to, you know, like to dinner or something like that, I just can't believe, and, and I won't, I don't, I don't socialize a lot with people in person, but like, I just can't believe how they're just like on Instagram, you know, like they're, they're just, they're not, they're not enjoying each other's company. They're kind of like, <laughs> you know, they, they, they've come together um, because it's like a routine thing that they do. But they could be on their phone on Instagram, you know, like at home. So uh, I do see that, uh, you know, having the ability to compartmentalize, have a conversation um, with somebody in person, um, why that is so marketable right now. Because most people don't know how to do it. No, I, you know what? And, and there's a, a large amount of truth to that because, listen, even when my wife and I go out, to dinner, okay, or yesterday we went out to brunch at our local pub and we settled in, uh, you know, with, within five minutes uh, and, and, and neither one of us hitting Facebook, but my, my wife's on her phone, checking job opportunities because she wants to get out of her fucking job like you wouldn't believe mm-hmm. and uh, I'm checking out sports news on my phone because I'm they got the college, football, the college basketball game on and I'm, and I'm looking mm-hmm. for uh, updates as we're waiting for our food Right. And then when the food came, we conversed. But during mm-hmm. that waiting period, and now, admittedly, it's my wife. We live together. We spend a lot of time sure. together. Sure. But, um, and if I'm hitting up, with, if I'm hanging out with somebody like, I don't know, Joe the lawyer, when we get together every couple of months, she's up in Connecticut, I'm down in New York mm-hmm. City, phones don't come out. We're, we're, we're talking and catching up. But there is that aspect of uh, when you're running a game, I haven't had this problem really at conventions, but I, I would have this issue running at a game store with a regular group mm-hmm. that if the pacing slowed down or somebody felt disengaged i guess right they got to be engaged in something else yeah the phone comes yeah. out and um it, it, it's part of the i guess the the new reality well it's kind of like i mean the way that i try and frame it is like i'm not going to tell you how to live your life <laughs> but I will talk about how, you know, things can shape you, right? Like right. if if you're if you're always just on your phone looking at what everybody else is doing, um, you're you're a pass. <laughs> I guess this was a, a meme that came out or whatever, but it's true. If you're just looking down feeds and just like kind of re- replying or whatever, and you're not making anything, you're not doing anything. You're an NPC in the world. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're you're an NPC in the world of reality, right? You and and that's okay, you know, to to just chill out and do some of that a little bit. But when it's all that you do, um, you're, you're everything's just passing you by. Now I know that a lot of people would look at what I do and be like, "Well, you're just wasting your time." It's like, well, <laughs> buddy. If I could tell you <laughs> how much research that I've done, how much work that I've put in to this screwing around, um, you would not believe it. Um, and these kind of things, you know, there's an explosion of, you know, notoriety or business or whatever, but it, it comes after, you know, 10, 15 years of work. Oh, yeah, nothing. nothing it's, it's strange because I, I see people that, come into the hobby and they want to be creators or social media bloggers or whatever. And they come into it and then they're like, well, I don't have a following. And, and it's like, well, just so you know, it took me 10 years to get where I'm at now. And that wasn't just because it, that was hard work and persistency right. and, and time. You don't, right. you don't, you don't jump into something. Or I shouldn't say you don't. You rarely does anybody jump into something and have immediate success, right? Because I mean, first, okay. first in an industry where, where you where you need a customer base, yeah. You, you know, it, it takes time to build that. You don't inherit it usually, right? Well, everybody just wants the attention. They don't yeah. understand how to get the attention, and it's it's okay. Like the way that I've done it or seen it. What I'm doing right now is I'm networking with people that, you know, 
all they're doing is kind of pushing buttons and following each other. And some, and that's called follow for follow. And a lot of people look down on that. A lot of people look down on the community of people that just, you know, get pump up their numbers, <laughs> basically. Right. Um, but I'm telling you, it's like cold calling. You know, I don't know how, how much like marketing or sales that you've ever done or are aware of from, you know, your work in the uh, in in the industry of, you know, helping to get some of the stuff put out. But um, it's definitely cold calling. It's like from what I've seen, I mean, people are like, well, you should just join a community and you should have a relationship with those people and you should blah, 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 blah. It's like, look, if those people are not really helping me do what I want to do. I want to find somebody motivated, all right? Even these follow for follow people, what you do is you get in there, you you follow a bunch of people, you see who's making stuff, you DM them, which is direct message. I don't know right. if you're down with the oh, lingo. I'm, <laughs> I'm down with the lingo. Not everybody listening might be down with the lingo. So. Right, right. So, so I'll you go over dungeon them, master yeah. them? What the hell are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> exactly. So that, that that's the, the other reason that I... Uh, that I clarify because it kind of like overlaps so much with our hobby, but uh, yeah. So you DM people, and you, you even if it's just a little little thing that you start off with somebody, just like, hey, thanks for following. Hey, you know, like what you're doing, that's really cool. You know, when do you do it? You know, like when, like ask, be interested in what they're doing along with what you're doing, and you are creating a um, a familiar, uh, what do I want to call it? Kind of like that um, personal connection. Dump- yeah, like that Dunbar's number connection, right? Like those 150 people that you can say, hey, I know you, like if you were walking into a room, right? So you 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 just work on that close group because that's what we can handle as, as humans, <laughs> you know? And then, uh, but to get to that 150 people, that will be like, hey, how you doing? And every once in a while, come by and be like, oh man, great stream. You're having a lot of fun. We're, you know, you're entertaining me. You know, they don't say this, but this is what they're thinking, right? Yeah. You know, and you're and you're and you're talking and interacting. To build that group, you're gonna have to talk to like a thousand times that many people by just going out on the internet and seeing who's who's just trying to capture some attention, just like you. Yeah. You know. But but they but they're capturing attention because they're doing something, right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. You just you gotta go out there, do the work, put in the work. Like a lot of people, are like oh, I don't like follow for follow, blah blah blah. It's because they don't like doing the work. It's a lot of work to to, to click that many buttons <laughs> and right. throw out that many DMs and 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 care. But you care enough to where you want them to see what their reaction back to you is. If you never get a reaction back, you're you're probably you know that that connection is nothing to you. It's like when I started uh, the blog Ten Cars Tavern. You had to do the footwork to get out. You know, you can start a blog. You're nobody's gonna know about your blog just by you starting it right you have so i had i participated in forums mm-hmm. i uh, participated in other blogs and had some great uh, conversations um and that is the way organically you're growing your connections and you hit a critical mass at some point mm-hmm. i don't know where that critical mass point is where suddenly it grows on its own it doesn't need the additional the now you can focus on like you said those 150 people but those 150 people uh, are still bringing in more readers or more viewers for you well those 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 150 people are like your cohort like the the, those are like like they're they're farther away than like a, a close friend or somebody that, like a close collaborator, somebody you work with all the time, but they are somebody where, um, yeah, you, you have enough of a relationship. Maybe you've done some work with them. Maybe you did something for them cool and they liked you because of that. Um, yeah, um, that I would say that that's kind of what I would tell somebody to target, but usually you probably want to double your target. So if you have like 300 people that, you have communicated with you do you do communicate either through your social media or actually working on stuff together on a regular <laughs> basis 
and and you you know like doing for, forum posts that kind of stuff that's that is social media communication that's that's just an yeah. older style so once you build that yeah those those aren't but those aren't fans right so this is the this is what i would tell people too is like you got two parts to your audience your first audience is somebody that is going to be working shoulder to shoulder with you you know you are building you're building a um i don't want to call it a team but you're building kind of like a i guess community is the right word you know but yeah. those first people in the community are going to be working like they're workers they're 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 makers they're working and like you know the way that you've built your community is perfect because you've got so many people that are really you know they make stuff they they <laughs> they they put value out there so um and then after you build that then you're going to you're going to start seeing attention and you'll get some attention before then but after that you know you'll start getting the attention now um the interaction with your audience instead of your cohort is very different you know like people feel like they have to be very personable with a fan you don't have to be very personable with a fan they like what you make they don't know you they don't like co your cohort some of them they might know you you know like your clo the close people maybe the top 10 people that you work with all the time they will know you everybody else they don't need to know you because they know your content you know so you want to have a relationship with them you want to reach out to them you you, you want to you want to uh answer them if they are really excited about talking to you or uh interacting with you or are like hey look at this this might help you out you know because you'll start getting that kind of stuff um that's all great it's good feedback um so but but you just you have to understand there's there's a huge gap between you know those people they're gonna want access to you right they're gonna want <laughs> they're gonna be like hey take our you know I, you know I'm just talking no. in general right now but like you know hey Tankar you want to go for out for coffee it's like uh, you're probably not gonna go out for coffee with the guy because you can only see so many people you can only interact with so many people and um, but if you were at a con and you were having like you had a you had a a table at a or a booth at a con and they came up and were like hey this is awesome can i get a selfie with you eric you know like that kind of thing um i'm sure you would want to do that and it's it I, has I, to do with I, how much I've energy been, you have. yeah well I, I, I've, I've been doing that because with my relationship with frog guy games i get to go to it's going to be four full weekend cons a year and I, since i started going to conventions I've, I've had people come up to me and and Shake, shake my hand, and their loyal readers. Now that I've been doing the podcast, I have people calling out my name from ten feet behind me because they recognize the voice. Right. <laughs> which is a totally different. Like, it's like, yeah. huh? Ripley. Yeah. And I, because of the podcast, people get to know me differently than just because of the blog. Because right. now they. They hear me. I, this, this is a, it's a bit more intimate than, Audio is powerful. than the, you know. So they certainly do know me better than people that just knew me from the blog. And it's just it's different. It's a different experience. It's very, um, it's rewarding, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's it's part of the compensation that I certainly uh, enjoy having for for doing all this all this stuff with the the blog and the discord and the podcast right just to have and, people. I, and I would just say that uh, the thing that a lot of people go wrong with I've seen on social media is um, if you're if you're out there promoting if you're out there you know like putting your content out there and you're never asking for anything in return the reason you need to do that is because you need resources to be able to live and you need resources to be able to um, interact with your community you know if you don't have the ability to go out there and interact with your community um, but you have all these people that know who you are but you're you know you're working two jobs and you're living in San Francisco and you know every moment like I'm 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 actually speaking from a specific thing that I read it was an article about a girl that did you know like she did all this makeup stuff and promotion and you know like did all these these videos on social media and stuff right. and 
even with monetization and that kind of stuff, because of where she was, she had nothing. Like, like she was penniless, basically. And so she was doing it for the straight attention. She was doing it for the straight self-aggrandizing attention. And that's to me that's tragic because it's like yeah she 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 was able to um what is it uh get this big audience but she wasn't able to negotiate with the folks that she was doing things with to be able to turn that into something where she doesn't have to wait tables and um to me that's tragic you know it's like she need all she would need is like you know, a little bit of guidance. Work, you know, do a little bit of that trade trade off and that kind of thing, and um, make something of that instead of being stuck in that situation forever. Yeah, but sometimes people only see what's directly in front of them. They don't see the wider picture. Yeah, and I think that in this case, she got caught in in her own immediate uh, situation. Well, because it feels good. You know, you get yeah. that, you get that, uh, um, uh, that attention, and the attention itself is a reward, also. But um, <laughs> we we all we all got to put food on the table, you know. Oh yeah. And I know. I know. Nowadays, there's a lot of help. You know, if you, you know, if you're if you're disabled or that kind of thing, to, compared to pretty much everywhere else in the world, and compared to like other times in history um no matter where you are as long as you're decent and you show yourself to be decent to a few people around you you're gonna have a roof over your head you know you're gonna be able to have enough money to feed yourself or you know do the do the things that you need to do to be able to subsist but then from there you gotta you gotta figure something out and you know i'm talking yeah. to people that are that are that are com- capable you know what i mean like no you, i you're, you know, if you're disabled or something like that to the point where you can't do anything, then that's one thing. But, like, if you're just really young, <laughs> you know, don't really have anything or, you know, you've hit a rough patch in your life or something like that, you know, you it, it, it's so much – you can actually pick yourself up nowadays. Um, I wouldn't say that about other times in history. No, there's a lot of opportunities these days. And uh... – Social media, the internet, self-publishing, uh, retail places like drive through mm-hmm. uh, have lowered the bar. If you, right. You know, and, and I and I I frequently tell people, like you know, people that have published on RPG now slash drive through, and they put out their stuff for free. And mm-hmm. listen, everybody loves free, but they don't always value free. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the big thing. You have to you have to price something at what it's worth. Because... And and even yeah, and, listen, and even if you want to give something away, right. I, I've always told people, you know, drive through has a pay what you want option. Right. And yeah, uh, it, it serves two purposes. It allows people to effectively donate for what would have been a free product, but also the secret that a lot of people don't realize is if you you offer something for free on drive through it will never rank. You right. will never see it get uh, copper or silver uh, in the uh, sales rankings, but pay what you want will. Even f- even copies that people pay $0 for wow, count for that sales. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a great tip for anybody that's out there that, that makes and, and puts out on that platform. And these are the kind of things, right? Just getting your hands dirty or doing the research to listen to people that have gotten their hands dirty on this kind of thing, you know, coming into Tinker's Tavern and trying, you know, get into the networks, networking society after you've shown that you've made a few things. Um, it's a great way to, um, to save a lot of time, you know, it's like, and, and, and that's us using our 20% to, um, help each other out. And yeah, yeah that's, that's a really good, um, what I want to call it a, a specific example. Um, and the people that are on, uh, that are doing crowdfunding, I mean, I saw a GDC presentation where they were talking about, um, the differences between, you know, these, um, crowdfunded things and, um, people that are just game designers and that's all they do. So, um, in the, in the, the, um, 
crowdfunding space, those people are learning how to do everything. You know, they're learning about marketing. They're learning about distribution. They're learning about, um, what is it? Uh, I guess uh, maybe even a little bit of uh, PR or whatever outside of the actual designing of their game. Now, that does take away time from being able to put your product together. But it lets you understand. You're getting an education, you know, if you really yeah. think about it. You know, it lets you understand the publishing side of things. So when you understand it, now you have knowledge that is leveraged to go present your next thing to publishers first instead of doing another Kickstarter. Because even if you made a little bit less money on that Kickstarter than you would have if you didn't have a publisher or like, you know, instead of going with Kickstarter, you went with publisher right. and you didn't get so much money in the door. Well, once you understand overhead <laughs> and you understand um, not just um, what is it like financial capital, but um, like time capital, you know, like understanding how much your time is worth, then you're able to leverage what you do. Well, you're able to leverage what that publisher does well and you're, both going to benefit that's that's what that's what uh you know capitalism is all about and some people might be like well these artists aren't getting paid anything and blah 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 and it's like well there's a lot of moving parts behind all that these things you know uh actually out the door and sold to and and really at that point you're selling business to business you're not even selling direct to a consumer you're selling to stores that want what you're doing so that they can distribute now there's a lot of direct sales out there but it's still you know when we're talking about like board games or something like that the bulk of those sales are going to go out to to retailers whether they're online retailers or you know like a physical retailer i am right now wrestling with the dog in my arms <laughs> she's okay. she's like daddy daddy it's been it's been too long it's been too long. Yeah. I've, she's actually, I mean, she's actually I usually very, very good, but and she usually waits for the uh, certain keywords where I'm signing out of an episode. But mm -hmm. I think uh, she got a little impatient. That's all right. I, I mean, I'm, I could, as you could tell, I could probably oh, talk about this for like I, the I, next eight hours, you know? Well, we might have to bring it back then. <laughs> well, I'd love that. Yes. And yeah, that would be great. And, um, I guess really I just wanted to kind of get out the big main ideas of like, you know, what can people that are in your audience that are, you know, working on things or the people that support those people that are working on things, you know, like to get them to encourage them to be like, this was awesome. We'd love for, to see you all, you know, like distributed all over, you know, talk to a publisher, you know, that kind of thing. Now, 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 Kevin, if people want to see, like, what is a public website that they can find your work at? So, um, so when it comes to public stuff that I've made, the best mm -hmm. thing for them to listen to would be the ProGM podcast. I've made two episodes of it. It's on Anchor, so that's anchor.fm slash ProGM podcast. And, Excellent. Um, when it comes to other things that I've done, uh, I have not practiced what I've preached when it came to social media for a long time. Um, I, you know, I've done I've done remixes of things and and that kind of thing. I'm I'm getting some new equipment here pretty shortly, so what I'm gonna be doing is uh, putting starting to put more of that stuff up on YouTube. Um, it may be under a different name, but I'm gonna tie I'm gonna try and tie everything it, that I do together. Um, your pro GM is uh, just one of the brands that I've been that I've been trying to develop. Okay. Well, I will make sure that I uh, include a link to your anchor in the show notes to this anchor cast. Yeah, and there's a lot of good information, very specifically about how I started um, being a pro GM, what I did, where I went, um, and how somebody else might be able to uh, also do that kind of thing. Excellent. Well, like I said, I'll I'll I'll, I'll mention to Pex that we got to bring you back because we got a lot more to talk about, oh, yeah. and uh, it, was, it was a good time. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Eric. Um, I I was really super excited to to sit down with you, and I I really wish I had more to show, but it's kind of like I I explained it to Pex. I was like, 
you know, what I do, it's kind of like being a fortune teller. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's kind of like, you know, it's behind closed doors. I don't record yeah, the, anything. The Wizards of Oz. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. Kind don't, of. Don't, you got to peek behind the curtain. Well, next time we'll peek behind the curtain a bit more. Yeah, that'd be cool. Well, again, folks, as as always, thank you for listening. Uh, thank, thanks to Kevin for being here. Um, figure uh, I will talk with you all tomorrow. As always, God bless and be well. Later, folks. <laughs>